Right Track Motoring, your online showcase for everything in the world of motoring. The Motor Press Guild, along with Auto Design O, hosted a panel discussion with four of the automotive world's top designers at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Eric Noble of Car Lab was moderator of the event. Let's listen to some of the comments from the panel. My name is Laura Burstein, I'm MPG president. I want to welcome you to what I am told is our fifth annual design panel. That's good, if you can believe it, five years. So our design panel today was made possible in part by our friend right up here, John Grafman. If you want to give a wave, you don't have to. Thank you, John, and Auto Designo. We also have sponsors um, to Bunk Speed, Linkage Design and Mothers, as well as Auctions America by RM. So please, let's give all of them a round of applause. Couldn't be here without them. Our panelists today in alphabetical order, and if you can all please come up, Derek Jenkins, Director of Design, Mazda North America. Get the first spot. Richard Kim, Senior Designer, Design Works USA. Jay Min, Chief Interior Designer for Volkswagen Group California. And Peter Schreier, Chief Design Officer for Kia Motors. We want to thank all of you gentlemen for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. And we're going to also bring up our moderator, as usual, Eric Noble of the Car Lab. We don't have a show if we don't have an audience. Um, and and y'all made a drive to be here. Uh, it's a weekday. We appreciate it. We're very appreciative of the companies that these gentlemen work for. Um, it was with a lot of effort, not just on John Grafman's part. His efforts are year-round um, for this event, um, but he has to work with someone in public relations or in studio relations for each of these automakers, and uh, it's, it's an individual effort. These are time-impoverished people, as, as most of us are. Um, their companies spend money to bring them here. Um, the reason is simple. Design is a language, and it's a language most of us don't get to speak in our daily lives. Um, so today we get to have a little bit of a look inside another culture, if you will. It's a culture of design. We could call this, by the way, I think, with the exception of Jay, the, the I used to work for Audi design panel <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at some level. Um, we have a, we have a topic today, that topic is Eurasian persuasion, and we will talk a little bit about the differences between European, American, and Asian design, or if there are differences. Um, but really what I want to do is, is, is celebrate a conversation with these individuals um, and have them talk about their individual design philosophies, their corporate design philosophies, what works and what doesn't. And if I'm doing this right, it's a conversation and it's fun. Um, I'm going to, at this point, uh, remove myself from this podium and sit back down in one of the chairs so as they address their remarks and answers to my initial questions, they're actually looking out at, at all of you. Um, and again, um, thanks to John Grafman, who's made this happen now for half a decade. So again, um, let's start. And I've got to pick on someone first. So um, the old guy is obviously Jay Min. <laughs> and deference always goes to age, Jay. So uh, it's, a, it's an easy question. It's probably one that you've heard before. But um, you know, what, what was it that caused you to throw your life away on automotive design? Oh, boy. Where did it start? I, I was a good kid. <laughs> Um, until I, well, it's, it's, it comes from my mom, so I don't know how believable it is, but apparently I used to throw tantrums uh, into which taxi that I would get into, and I'll just absolutely refuse until a particular model of taxi comes by. <laughs> I don't remember, uh, but apparently that, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't name any brands or anything, but I think that was kind of like the beginning of you know. <laughs> so do you own a question. so you own a checker today? Um, yeah. <laughs> Derek, 
um, not too terribly long ago, you went to school to do all of this. Um, e each of us, as we study for whatever it is we think we're going to go off and do, there's a vision, right? The, the, uh, the carrot that's out in front of us. Um, now that you're out there doing it and now that you're managing those that do it, um, is, it, is the carrot, uh, does it taste as you envisioned? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's one of those things where you come out of school and you're kind of green-eyed and you're super excited about doing car design. <coughs> and I can't say that that's really changed at all. Um, but you do kind of, along the way, you kind of grow and you evolve. You, you take on different tasks and different challenges to be a little bit more realistic about things. I still think, though, you, there's part of you that wants to kind of break new ground and really try some new things. But it's, it's been a constant evolution for me. It's, uh, it's been a, a real growth in a way. And it does, even now, you, you do things, it's like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. You know, and that's just part of it. I think it's, it's like any profession, there's trial and error, and you make mistakes, and you've got you to gotta figure it out and move on to the next project, you know. Peter, you're really new at this. So this will be a, a fresh observation for you. Now that you are a car designer, what's a day in the life of a car designer like? <laughs> it, um, I think that the normal day uh, in the life doesn't really exist. It's always kind of different. You know, it depends. Uh, um, you always have new challenges or new new themes to work with, and and uh, new situations. And and you know what you just said. You 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 know. By the time you work, you're in this job and you grow, but you never stop learning. You know, it's, it's you always, it's always suddenly you find something, and you think, okay, uh, why did I not think about that before? <laughs> um, Richard, uh, your particular studio, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a while, uh, offers, I think, the opportunity to do some uh, non-automotive projects. You ever worked on a non-automotive project? Yeah, sure. Um, design works is split in automotive and then third-party clients. So I've had the privilege to work on buses, trains, plane interiors, yachts. Airplane it, interiors. Yeah, sure. Can you and talk then, about it? For well, who? It's, it's just a different frame of mind, and that way it, keep, it keeps your your daily business exciting. When you just when you you know think you know how to put a car together, it's you know you're thrown on an airplane interior, and then all of a sudden you get to relearn things. It's pretty exciting. You're not selecting what color blue is in the loo, are you? No, 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 that comes from the color and trim department. I haven't worked with them yet, <laughs> but uh, um, maybe one day. We do a lot of exchange between departments, and um, it keeps it exciting. You learn from, from the other disciplines. So the, the topic today is Eurasian persuasion, and, and there, had, there had to be a headline. Um, each of you, though, has had an opportunity to work for an Asian and a European or an Asian and an American auto manufacturer. Are there substantive differences in the way that uh, an Asian manufacturer approaches design compared to a European manufacturer? Any of you? Well, I, I think between uh, the Asian companies, or at least the one that I know, uh, and uh, the way Europeans work and think, and, and, uh, and the Americans, I guess, or well, I probably know also, <laughs> is, uh, there's a big difference in culture. In, in car culture, that in 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 Europe, in America, uh, we have a hundred years old uh, car industry and car culture developed over the years. You know, in, with different facets from custom cars to racing and and uh, vintage car scene and all sorts of things and and uh, car design and and uh, whatnot and convertibles and stuff and. Uh, the um, Asian car industry and, and uh, so far as also the Korean is very young only. So um, they, they had to catch up very fast. And uh, this is also some, something that I, I admire about the, uh, the Koreans in my case, um, how fast they were able to you know, start from zero to come up and be the fourth biggest car company in the world now. Um, and this is also something that, you know, the, this, this difference in culture is, is um, it reflects on the product and it reflects on the markets in these countries. You see different cars on Korean streets than you would see here uh, because it's the younger market and 
and it's still a supply market where people get supplied with cars, first of all, and you only see sedans, for example. And uh, the, the uh, picture on the street here and, and, and in Europe is a lot more colorful. You see, you know, in Europe you see a lot of uh, like uh, estates, for example, which is a lifestyle, to, to have a wagon is a lifestyle thing in, in, in Europe. Here you don't see any. Uh, um, and uh, here you see, you know, bigger cars and, and, and uh, convertibles and sports cars and luxury cars and also, the, you know, a very, a, a, a very uh, um, colorful mix of different of different types and and uh, I think this is also you know what makes the difference between the markets and also the attitude of of, uh, of the people who make the cars. Derek, you came from Volkswagen to Mazda, mm -hmm. um, which in many ways is is uh, becoming even more of a Japanese auto manufacturer. It's l recently you know pulled back production from from North America, yeah. for instance. Um, what startled you most, or what did you find uh, the biggest difference in cultural terms between the two design departments? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, obviously I've worked together with Peter for years at, at Volkswagen and Audi, and um, kind of the, the European approach of very disciplined uh, level of execution and being extremely conscious of kind of the vehicles that had come before, you know, and how to evolve that language and how to build that language. The themes that were developed are really catering to that, you know, and when you're developing a, a theme for, for a German car, it's really about, you know, how do you set up the proportion? Is this theme going to make the proportion look low and sporty and, and, and in this case, Germanic? Um, where, for example, at Mazda, it's much more of a thematic discussion. It's an emotional discussion, even, you know, really trying to get a lot uh, more creative in a kind of spiritual way or w where you pull that inspiration, that's like more the priority than the execution discussion. Um, I think what we're trying to do at Mazda is find a, a little bit more of a balance of those things. So you get kind of something that's a little bit more high level and, and in space and creative, but with more disciplined execution. But there's definitely a different approach there, different value system, you know. Richard, I think uh, you got to start part of your career at, uh, at a Nissan studio? Yeah, at a short time there. Short okay, time there. compare and contrast that with, uh, with where you are now at DesignWorks. Well, it was, um, that was the beginning of their studio opening, and it was a studio with a very international team. So it was Nissan, a Japanese company, but in London with designers from BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Volkswagen, you name it. So, it wasn't really um, easy for me to say that, you know, the culture was going in one way or another. It was just sort of high level of design and discipline and creativity trying to make really nice products. And I feel like <clears throat> DesignWorks is very similar. It's very international. It is a California studio, but um, California itself is a very international and sort of color colorful and diverse place, and it attracts that kind of, kind of um, design. Jay, as outside observers, many of us look at designs, and a very common discussion is that, oh, well, that, uh, that, that wheel design looks like it's come from that manufacturer, or that day DLO, that daylight opening, looks like it's been copied from this other manufacturer, or, uh, or that grill certainly seems to be mimicking that of another car. Um, by way of example, for instance, um, there's been a lot of uh, media, and of course media are wonderful folk, I want to acknowledge that here tonight. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of media coverage of the, of the, uh, the just-released Ford Fusion and the fact that the grill bears a somewhat striking resemblance to a brand's grill that they used to own, um, Aston Martins. Um, from, a, from a design management standpoint, how do you view that sort of thing? It, it is a, does Aston Martin really own a grill shape? And um, is it okay if the, the grill on the Fusion resembles it? That's, that's a really good question. And a tough one to answer. Um, I mean, we, we do have multiple brands under an umbrella. In, in um, your studio in Santa Monica? Yes. Um, Volkswagen Group is consisted of 12 brands. And then we get to actually work with each of the brands. Uh, some of them is kind of not really relevant to where we are, um, such as you know, some of the truck brands or commercial vehicles. 
but we actually do get to work with a lot of brands. Um, the reason that I'm saying that is because all the brands under this umbrella is very, very independent. Um, one of the advantages that we have is to actually strategically work out or carve out each brand philosophy and work with it. Um, one of the interesting thing is, um, yes, you do see certain things and you get used to it and you see the advantage of it and somehow subconsciously, unconsciously, you kind of go closer to that. That definitely do, you know, that, that, that happens, um, working as creative, you know, more visual person. But you'll be surprised how often the adage, great minds think alike, also comes to uh, fruition. And what I mean by it is that um, certain, certain, I would say, optimal visual character under certain conditions, um, it comes down to a few choices of actually optimizing certain shapes. And it's not just following certain things as golden means or anything. Uh, I mean, cars do serve a very distinct purpose of uh, carrying. I mean, when you just look up the dictionary the definition, it's not a sculpture that sits in your mantle. It is a very serious product that has to carry people and cargo from point A to point B. That's its primary uh, function. And when you actually kind of work through that, there are very, very small lines that you can walk. So we do actually have a lot of, you know, we go through a lot of different um, variations of themes and whatnot to actually kind of differentiate certain things. But I guess what I'm saying is, you know, under those circumstances, um, it is quite common to come to a certain um, solution, visual solution. And then we try to differentiate from it. Peter, uh, under your leadership at, uh, at Kia, certainly there's a, a unique Kia look today um, that has been widely acclaimed. Part of that look is a grill design um, that some folks have called the beaver teeth, um, or the bucky beaver teeth, in fact. I think Derek has called them when I've talked with him in private. I told you not to bring that up. You spoke later. <laughs> but... but uh, if, if that's become a signature of part of the face of a Kia, are you okay if a, if a brand in China were to begin using that same grill shape? Um, not, not really, but um, I think you cannot avoid these kind of things. It's, it's, uh, um, um, sometimes also, uh, like Jay said before, you know, also coincidences happen. They happen. I mean, I, I, I would not appreciate if someone just takes the same thing and, and copies it. Sometimes, really, as I say, coincidences can, can happen, but uh, if something is really um, simply copied literally the same thing, then uh, I, th I think it's a bit um, unfair or not, it's not the fair sporty way of, of, of doing things, of, of, of competing. I think uh, uh, everybody should try a little more by doing something individual as much as possible. Richard, uh, BMW certainly has a very distinctive grill design, but if we were to move beyond that and say that in some ways BMW design has always, um, in, in one way or another, evoked a Bavarian soul, if you will. Um, in other words, the car somehow, at Derek, to Derek's point uh, earlier about brand and brand origin, somehow does a BMW uh, need to communicate the fact that it's a German mark, or even that it's a Bavarian mark, although it's an international luxury brand? How, well, how, how German should a BMW design be? Well, I think more importantly than that, uh, a BMW has to stay true to its, its core values. It should be dynamic, it should be sporty, um, it, should be, it should be fun to drive. The, the designers, they don't actually come up with the designs all by themselves, unfortunately. There's, there's a, um, a lot of other smart people that help us get the designs to where they are. Peter's now looking at you surprised. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, for example, the, uh, the proportions of BMW, right? the, the dash to axle, the weight distribution, the overhangs, all of these things are, are done with aerodynamics and, and engineering in mind, <clears throat> along with design um, support. So it's sort of um, not just a, design, a designer making a, a, a line on a piece of paper and then eventually clay. It's, it's sort of this, this mix of, of great minds that, 
that that make it what it is. So it's the it's the history of the brand, not where the brand is from. Is well, what you're you know, saying? I mean, speaking of history, the the grill's been the kidney grill and the BMW has been there since I think 1930, the 1930s. It's something that um, BMW does sort of take on as heritage and you know refines it and and does sort of signif uh, sort of symbolize the the core um, the core of BMW. Jay, sh Jay, should Audi design be fundamentally um, German? W what is German? I mean, if you, I'm kind of asking you a rhetorical question, but you know, the German design comes from the culture. It, it doesn't have any particular look. Um, I think what what we perceive as German design comes from the culture, uh, and certain things look certain ways because. What, what I find most interesting is each, each kind of nation or brand doesn't have a particular look, but it's, what's interesting is the usage scenarios of those vehicles historically. I mean, we use the same cars differently in US than in Germany or in Korea or in China, for example. And what's really interesting for me, and that's kind of like, that keeps me up at night and actually that makes me wake up in the morning is this kind of challenge of taking new influences. It's not changing overnight, but just adding all these different things and that eventually kind of like gives you a different um, aesthetics because it's about evolving your brand. What you used to kind of have as a core, let's say German design or you know Japanese design or American design. And as designers, I think that's really what's kind of like interesting for us and you know keeps us going. I mean, does that answer your question? And if right now that has led to, in, in, in many views, um, a position of leadership for Audi mm -hmm. in, in luxury design, um, how do you maintain that? And, and Peter, I'd ask you the same question. If, if in many ways, um, among sort of common brands, Kia now has some design leadership, um, if, that lead, if that design itself begins to attract folks because it's fresh and because it's new, and then you have them as buyers, and they like the design. Do you dare do fresh and new again, or do you have to keep what they came for, which is the, the design that they bought? How do you manage to stay ahead in long term? Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm happy that we have managed to set up a, a product range that is attractive and uh, that is very successful, and uh, you know, uh, being able to have a, our, our own front face and, and so on. Um, but I think we cannot we cannot stop. You know, of course, we need to keep uh, uh, um, improving, and uh, you know, in, in, it's it's an ongoing process, evolving process of next product and next one, next next one always. You know, develop and and, and, and make it better, but keep the direction. So in, in the same, and not make something. You know, sometimes the Asian uh, Asian uh, way of doing things. If 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 you if you um, if you do something that looks similar to the one you had before, only better and new, uh, in, in this kind of thinking, often they, they, they would think it's not new because it's not different. And, we, uh, and I think we are not making new cars to, to only to make them different, we're making them to make them better. Mm -hmm. so, so if BMW's had its, its kidneys uh, for, for a grill uh, motif since the 30s, you know, going on 100 years, or, or certainly 80 or 90, um, would it be a good thing if when you retire in 35 or 40 years, uh, Kia continues the, the beaver teeth? I think it would be nice, yeah, of course, I would do that, yeah. Retire or they should continue? No, I mean, well, in 40 years I'm almost 100, so I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, it, it would be, um, uh, I would recommend, or I would uh, wish that uh, this theme would Continue and, and you know and bring a certain continuity and believability into the products and the product range and into the brand. So, Derek, you've been at uh, at Mazda now for th three and a half years. Three and a half years. So we're probably not yet seeing the the vehicles that have that are coming through the system in, in your guidance. Uh, do you have an objective, much as BMW might have had uh, many years ago, much as Peter just expressed? Do you have an objective that your work becomes timeless in a way? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, as a designer, you want to do something that 
is memorable, has an impact, but also, um, you know, ages gracefully. And to me, that comes down to how you prioritize design, um, whether it be your proportions or the discussion about the face of the car and how that, that evolves, how it ties into the heritage of the brand, you know, so it's uh, something new, but yet somehow familiar, recognizable to the brand. I think it's super important. I mean, for me, you know, um, Maz is one of the few or potentially the only Japanese brand that really has a, I think, has a really nice automotive kind of lineage, you know. It's a brand that's always been dedicated to motorsports and, and sporty vehicles, you know, where a lot of other brands, you know, you go to the Tokyo Auto Show, and there's just some, some freaky vehicles on display, you know. And sorry, <laughs> I, I want to design a car, you know. And that's what I think Mazda wants to design nice cars, you know, and that for me is the number one kind of priority and really kind of doing that in a way that's something that lasts well, I think, um, of course, you want to do that. So you can, you can hint, I mean, should we expect a continuation of the Heath Ledger Joker grill? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rich, Richard, if, if we uh, switch gears now and, and talk about, or stop switching gears and use a CVT, and talk about sustainability, uh, what really is um, sustainable car design? Um, well, I was privileged to work a part of, uh, as a part of the uh, BMW i uh, design team. Um, and they are a team that um, really wants to celebrate sustainability and make it cool, make it fun, make it exciting. It doesn't have to be a compromise. Um, and one of the leading factors is, again, it's not quite necessarily the designers that do it. It's a lot of it's the technology, the engineers, the aerodynamics that sort of lead the way as designers sort of take the, um, sort of um, help develop these cars into, into finalized products. But, but the pursuit of a 0.25 drag coefficient and um, European pedestrian protection standards and, and American rollover standards, uh, aren't all of these, in a way, um, constraints that make cars want to look more and more alike and, and therefore the enemy of design? Well, I, I don't know if I agree with that because I think the old school notion of, you know, the horses and then the carriage and then the, the trunk is still around today, but like at BMW i or in a lot of electrical platforms, you sort of, you know, you, you cut the horses out and you sort of redistribute everything else and you, know, you really get the... To the, the chance to hit the reset button, and you do have a different layout. You do have a chance to, to uh, influence the driver's life and the way that they get to use that vehicle. Peter, would a volume-selling Kia electric car, would it look like a Kia? Uh, like a Kia, definitely, because it's a Kia. <laughs> Um, but you've, as Richard stated, in some ways you have a chance to change all of the proportions. Yeah, I think if, um, if, you, if you change, uh, well, if you get the chance, you know, if you have a new package layout for such a vehicle uh, and you're able to change all the proportions, I think it should, still should be made in a way that it's recognizable as a car that comes from the brand uh, uh, that that makes it. I mean, your, your, your I vehicles, they do not have the typical BMW proportions, but they definitely somehow, you know, you can tell that they are BMWs. And, uh, and uh, uh, when we, if we would uh, uh, um, approach this kind of, such a kind of project, I would uh, make it in a way that you can recognize it as a Kia, obviously, even if the proportions would shift. One of the ways that Europe traditionally has achieved more efficient cars is simply through size. Um, Europeans are willing to tolerate much smaller cars, even in luxury uh, spectrum of the market than maybe Americans are. Jay, how difficult is it to translate luxury to a truly small car? I mean, it is true that, um, you know, in America, things are more value-oriented, and obviously dimension and sp spatial quality um, is much more appreciated here. And you do have the room to actually uh, enjoy it. Um, but it's not about making the vehicle smaller. Uh, it has more to do with eliminating excess. So it's not about compromising the room that you actually can enjoy inside a vehicle. Uh, but So it's not a smaller interior? Uh, no, smaller vehicles and uh, just 
you know, uh, giving up space, uh, those are two different things. And I mean, traditionally, you know, especially with Volkswagen and Audi vehicles, we've been trying to, and talking about what, what makes Volkswagen and Audi and all these brands uh, retain their distinctive look, it's not just about, you know, this line on the fender and how grill looks, but it's the layout of the vehicle. And, you know, a lot goes into actually optimizing the usable space of the vehicle. Not Because if you just make the vehicle small, it doesn't scale because human beings don't change in their size. So it's about getting rid of excess space and talking about sustainable electric cars. It's quite exciting for us because there's a lot more freedom now. I mean, nothing is really mechanically connected to this huge lump of a power chain. Now you can distribute those elements. Overall volume might not decrease, especially now, because the batteries are quite big and they're heavy, but it's just this opportunity of redisplacing. As Richard discussed. Yes. Uh, Derek, your studio work on other forms of mobility? Um, not, not really. Are you solving the last mile problem most of us had getting here tonight? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, we're, we're still primarily focused on, on uh, on our lineup, you know, we don't have a, a consultancy like DesignWorks. It's solely dedicated to our next generation products, primarily. Uh, Richard, uh, you you do have a separate consultancy. Um, you and I talked earlier, and I joked about the fact that um, historically, uh, as media, when we visit design studios, they have the token yacht that they once worked on uh, on the wall in the lobby. But I think that you actually have a, a separate profit center. Is that right? Yeah, so DesignWorks is uh, a subsidiary of BMW Design, and half of the studio is dedicated to third-party client work. Um, Intermarine is a, is a boat company that is a, a, a big client for us. And Intermarine out of Intermarine Brazil. Intermarine out of Brazil. And we started on one program, and then it led into a lot of other um, boats in their lineup. And I did have the, the privilege to work on uh, one of these programs. And, and it really is something different. It's mobility, it's, um, it's transportation, but with a completely different uh, mindset. So DesignWorks is, is lucky in that way. And if I go to the other side of the building and work on a boat design, um, it's very easy for me to do something different just because I'm not around it all the time. And in that way, it's also the other way where someone who works on boats or products, they can come over to the car design studio and offer their input, and usually that's always a fresh approach as well. Is more creativity available in other forms of mobility than it is in cars? Are we, are we truly the most regulated form of design? Well, I mean, for me, as, as a senior designer, I'm going to work on one proposal. That's my proposal that uh, it takes all the boxes for BMW core values, but it will have something from my own experiences from what I like, whether it's something from architecture or fashion or product design, I'll try to infuse that to sort of offer my take on uh, what a BMW should be. Peter, uh, your, your studios at all right now have the ability to work in areas outside of automotive? Not really, uh, we, because we, we are so filled up with, with work. You know, we have, we have so many projects going on that all our three big Design centers are full of of, uh, of production work for 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 cars, so there is no uh, space at the moment for other things. You know, I think our company is too young and too too eager to to um, to make good cars. To uh, at the moment, we cannot do something on the side. Even I don't think so. Jay, you can sit in your studio at the Santa Monica Airport and. Um, breathe jet fuel. Um, <laughs> only only during the day they have curfew. So. <laughs> and, and and you can you can watch Hollywood's elite come and go from their from their charter flights or or their shared ownership jets. Um, you guys get a chance to work on other forms of mobility. Um, really, but yeah, we we do get. Uh, a chance once in a while. Uh, we do have a dedicated group of internal product design studios uh, per different groups. You're doing for, teapots? Uh, among others, but on wheels. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. 
Uh, but yeah, we do have uh, dedicated uh, product design groups within ones in Munich and ones in Wolfsburg, obviously. Uh, we do participate once in a while. Uh, and once in a blue moon, we known to do some other stuff, such as chandeliers and whatnot. Uh, but uh, yeah, as, as uh, with the other guys, we are so swamped with our current products that uh, as we don't do it as much as we like. So I think we hear, and, I, and I'm going to assume that Derek, you're as busy as, as these as these other guys as a studio. Um, you're not you're not looking for what you're doing tomorrow. It's probably no. already on your plate. Time's occupied. Um, we've got some um, aspiring designers, certainly in, in in our audience tonight. Some some folks who are students of design at Art Center College of Design. Um, how do each of you, as design managers, um, balance that need? for sort of more folks with, with the need for experienced folks. In other words, you know, Peter, if you grow a design operation the size of yours as quickly as you have, you can't do that with people fresh out of school? Yeah, I think you need, you, of course you need uh, some people fresh out of school to, to bring in fresh blood. Uh, but also, you know, uh, especially in the studios um, that are not in the in the in the mother company, they're, they're like they are not satellite studios in our case, but they are in a different country. Uh, you need you need some people who have a good experience and they ha who have s quite some experience before. Otherwise, the, you know they 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 need to have seen a, a car company from inside, uh, and you need this kind of people. Is, is, it, is it common then for, uh, I mean, obviously, Derek, you, you were recruited um, and at some point, uh, so, were, so were you two fellows. Um, is, it, is it common for studios to, um, to poach people from, from, from other shops? Sure. Is All it okay? The time. I'm working on it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's a lot of, like anything, there's a lot of um, movement and it's a small, everybody knows everybody, it's pretty small. Um, you know, so uh, people are quite well connected more so than ever. Um, but I, you know, like Peter said, I, I think it's about a balance. You're, you're trying to find experienced people. You're trying to find people that you're comfortable working with. You know, people don't realize how much um, in a small studio, how much of the results, the design quality that comes out is the result of personalities and real teamwork and people taking their individual strengths and, and really bringing them together. You know, that's what for me, all the projects that I'm the most proud of are, are really uh, collections of personalities and, and the work that comes out of that. So I think that's really important. And I think um, having an international team is also really important. You know, I mean, even though we're in Los Angeles, I think it's because we're in Los Angeles, um, it's, it allows you to be able to draw people from all over the world, you know. You know what, what Derek is just saying, that is something that for me is very important as well is, is not only the potential, the skill of the single designer that is important. Important is also that you need to be able to communicate with these people the right way. You, you know, uh, you know you, the atmosphere in the studio needs to be right and the, the chemistry needs to be right between the people. So if you are, you know, you have to have something like a blind understanding. Like in a, in a band, when you play in a band and you know, you know, you play one instrument and you know you exactly need to know what the other guys are doing in that moment without without uh, looking all the time it, it you need this kind of friendly and harmonious sometimes of course you need a little bit of discussion and 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 and, 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 and uh, 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 a bit of a battle it's a competition but also you need a harmonious atmosphere of people who all, you know we all you know at the end we want to make a good car and and uh, if the atmosphere is not right, you never you will never be you don't come out with good stuff. And and Jay, how do you manage that sort of activity across multiple brands? Can you really have someone go from a Seat to a Lamborghini? Yes. We, is we, it a good we idea? Have, yeah, each design has um, six different hats behind the board, and every time <laughs> it is tough, but it is definitely possible. And once you actually get into the discipline of it. Um, it is definitely possible, and that's one of our actually uh, advantages or disadvantages. It can be um, double-edged sword, but once you actually get into the rhythm of it, uh, it's something that we actually enjoy doing. 
Richard, you and I talked earlier about um, how the, the, the sort of technical uh, level or the technical requirements of, of, of your trade continue to increase. And um, you know, one of our sponsors is Bunk Speed, and you all use their, their product. Um, and that sort of stuff becomes more and more sophisticated as a tool. Um, it's not difficult for us to envision a time um, when uh, a General Motors uh, or another firm could take a, a design language, art and science, and say, well, actually, the radii uh, are in this sort of a range. The angularity uh, tends to be in this sort of a range. This is the DLO. Um, these are the sort of proportions. Um, and this is the way we handle the parting lines. And these are the hard points. And put all of that in and have um, some design proposals drop out. Um, at, at that point, which we know will come to, does the role of the designer cease? In other words, if a computer can write Mozart today, and probably better and better in the next 10 or 15 years, why can't a computer do, why can't you know, Wayne Cherry continue to, to uh, produce art and science uh, 30 or 40 years from now for Cadillac? Somebody, ha but someone would have to write that algorithm, you know what I mean? Someone would have to create that software to do that. I mean, that, that in itself, creating the range of creativity within that algorithm. I mean, there's always going to be a creative element, I think, irregardless of what degree the, the, uh, the technology hits, you know? I, I don't, I, I always look at technologies, it's just another, it, it just gives me more freedom to do what I want to do quicker and do more of it, so. It's, it's like, how do we take that and grow it? But the idea that you could just punch the numbers is still, to me, because someone's going to come along and take that tool and create something that nobody else is doing with that tool. You know, that's, that's the difference. So even if those sorts of tools exist, they're not used to mimic or to continue, they're used to push forward? That's what I would think. Richard? Yeah, I agree. And, and what Peter was saying about like the whole band thing, like there's something that you can't really say yeah. about design. It's it's there's something Yamaha Music School won't make jazz musicians. I don't know. There's something metaphysical about it. There's a lot of no look passes. There's a lot of like just getting each other and people that you really need to make a good design. Um, yeah, like any like a sports team. There's personalities, and you need all the different people and the personalities. So. I don't know, I'd like to see the machine that makes a car, that'd be There's interesting. All, the, all these different cultures behind each individual that works in a, in a design studio, you know? In that design studio, there are engineers, and those engineers come to you with requirements. Or, or do you come to them? Peter, who, who's more responsible for a vehicle like today's Optima, engineering or design? Um, I think in the ideal case, this is, it's the combination of the two. It, it's, uh, you know, in, in the old days, it was always this, kind of opinion that the engineers and the designers are always like this. And, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, during my long time at, at, uh, in the German companies, uh, I, have, I have learned that this process can really work very well in, in uh, working together. And uh, uh, like, like what, what Richard explained before, that uh, like at BMW, there is people who, you know, who stand behind the thing that the chassis is all right, that the overhangs are getting shorter and this and that. And, uh, and, and they work together with the designers. And, and uh, I think that you know, no matter if you, it's, a, it's an exterior thing or something in the interior, you always need to discuss with an engineer and try to find a solution maybe together because um, the engineers know exactly what kind of constraints we have and what you can do or not do. And sometimes a designer maybe knows the way around because he really is a little more creative in some ways and say, if we, you know, if we make it a little lower here and a little higher on this end, then maybe we can get to the same thing uh, uh, or using, you know, uh, going around the problem in, in a different way. And uh, so it's the designer cannot do it alone, and also the engineers can't do it alone. Derek, your studio has how many, how many designers at Mazda North America? Um, we're about 15. 15, and yeah. how, how, many, how many studio engineers? Um, well, our building is connected to our R&D facility, so that facility is about 
45 engineers, but that's research engineers, it's package engineers. It's so this is like the Alamo, you're just completely outnumbered. Well, it is, but I had control who comes in and out of the door, so, <laughs> to the studio, so that, but honestly, you know, I, I totally agree with Peter, it's, you need the engineering, engineering, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mutual uh, necessity, and th those guys are passionate to do great cars, you know. Jay, how many engineers do you guys let in the Santa Monica door? How many of them we let them in the door? Yeah. Uh, we do have one full-time uh, studio engineer. You let him most, in, most of the time? Yeah, he actually comes in, but uh, no, he's, he's our friend, in fact. He's our liaison to um, the engineering group in Germany. How, but how many designers do you have? Boy, I would say about 35. And, and just the one engineer to police you all? Yeah, but we do have, in fact, we do have great um, um, dip into the German studio engineering group, uh, both exterior and interior and different multiple groups. And we've been getting a lot of uh, great support from the stu studio engineering group, who actually takes our request and um, you know, works out the solutions with the actual technical groups. Richard, how many people in uh, Design Works here in California? Uh, I don't know the exact number in California. We are the, the largest group. Uh, I think globally Design Works in their four studios has 135 designers. And roughly in your studio, how many engineers? Just the automotive department. We have two, two. engineers. Yeah, but we're always connected to Munich. Um, they're, you know, as Jay mentioned, they're a liaison. They're there to help us. And... Um, you know, I agree with everyone. I think uh, when I was in school, I, was, I always heard that the engineers were the, the enemy, you know, like there was always some sort of conflict, but it's, it's not at all the case. So. Char I noticed Charlie Volgheim just came up here. Um, Charlie, this is so starting to sound a little bit like I'm talking to um, car company executives and they're, they're um, going on about how much they actually love their dealer partners, right? <laughs> Are you buying this? <laughs> They do love their dealer partners. Um, if, 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 uh, if you could change the way that your studio operated, Derek, um, how would, I don't mean on a specific program, but d define your ideal automotive design studio. That's tough. You know, probably. We'll work together. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, if I'm completely honest, probably our biggest challenge is how, how we communicate back and forth to the, to the mothership. To, to, to Hiroshima, to, yeah. in this case. Yeah, and how we can be, I, I quite honestly, would like to be even more transparent. Uh, you know, if we could teleport, man, you know? Or if I had some way, some kind of immersive virtual cave where we could all be together every afternoon to, rev you know, to really get constantly on the same page. Because I feel like, that distance is still the biggest gap to kind of getting a unified direction. And um, the tech, that's, what, that's the technology I need, is something that really can help us transport. It's not enough to just put your work on the, on the share file at the end of the day and, and hope they take a look or talk about it over the phone. or any, you know We've done every possible form of conferencing, but somehow trying to get that link closer together that's, that would make the difference for me. Jay, you're nodding. The video conference, teleconference doesn't work. I mean, that's why we still take these, what, how, what, 6,000 pound clay model, uh, fly over them um, for presentations in some cases every month. Um, and talking about technology, that's kind of like, you know, bunk speed and whatever visual, visualization software. It won't, it won't replace designers. Uh, but what, is, what it is enabling us to do is possibly cutting these physical presentation down to absolute minimum because we can actually have interactive discussions maybe over a secure ISDN line or something. Um, Peter, to bridge that gap, you go back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. You talked about the fact that I think since you started with, uh, with Kia, you've been to Korea, I don't know, 93 times or something. Uh, which is a lot of kimchi, by the way, and uh, our apologies to your wife or condolences. Um, but um, when you arrive, and you just have, so you, you travel between Seoul, uh, Germany, uh, your studio there, your home in, in the Ingolstadt area, and the United States. Do you, 
every time you arrive someplace, you're still hit by something that's different, right? When you, when you arrive to the United States, what continues to strike you as different about this place and our automotive taste? Yeah, it's, the nice thing is that, uh, you know, being able to travel so much uh, that you learn about these different markets and you see them all the time and also see how they're changing and, and see how a car looks different in a different part of the world. And, uh, how does a car look different here? Um, well, here, you know, they, they all look smaller <laughs> because, <laughs> because everything is bigger here. Yeah. Richard, you go back and forth um, very often between Germany um, and, and here in California. Mm -hmm. um, when you come back from half a year in Germany, what strikes you that's, that's remarkably different about cars in the U.S. or, or the way we use them? Um, well, here we, we use them. Over there, they, they don't need to use them as often. The designers aren't using cars. I think they are, but um, one thing about my life in Munich is that I can use a bicycle, I can use the, the, the subway, and I can use my car on the weekends. But it's different here. You're, you're, you have much more of a connection. You, know, you have to use the car, and I think you, you have to use the car, therefore you buy the car that you love, and then you, you take care of that car. Um, and over there, at least for me, uh, I try not to use a car. I find that um, the system is, is so nice, and living two, two miles away, I can ride a bicycle, then jump in a car when I want to go and visit um, the rest of Europe quite easily. So, Jay, what's the biggest difference, America and Europe? I, I generally agree with Richard, um, but the biggest difference for me is that it, we are a lot more dependent on personal mobility here. And then I think we want to be to a certain degree. Um, there is a lot more, let's say, whimsical sense of uh, owning a car. And I'm just looking at the Hollywood sign right there. <laughs> and when you just talk about US, that's one thing. But especially being in this region, um, that's definitely more special. And that, that, that's, I think, is why we are here, actually. We do have studios here. It's kind of like the, um, you know, the experimental little chemical dish that all the reactions happen, and we are here to actually observe. And, you know, not all of that will go into production, um, but that's our job to kind of, like, observe and kind of sort out what will be more useful in the future. The way people live is different. The density of the streets, it's really, really dense. The streets are even narrower than in Europe. and. Uh, I mean, just the, 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 the kind of look of, of the streets is just so, so different from a kind of Western culture. And I feel like um, we've all seen glimpses of what, what Japan is like. And it, it's, it's very much like that. And you go there, and somehow it all fits, you know, and, and you appreciate it for that. But there's definitely, I think, a different sense of what the car's role is and what car culture is. You know, you don't. It, you know, I'm, I'm born, I was born here, I was born in California, and I grew up in this kind of super dense automotive, like, enthusiast kind of world, you know? And when you go there, I don't, I don't necessarily see that dense enthusiasm for the car. There's certainly some quirky, unique things and some individualization that goes on, but it's much, much different than here in that sense. I'll, I'll let uh, any one of you start with this, but I'd like all four of you to answer because we're going to wrap momentarily. Um, you're sitting before, um, as you often are as individuals, you're sitting before media, but this isn't the interview about the concept car that was just unveiled. It's a, it's a group of, of Southern California automotive media um, who are here um, to hear you talk more generally about design. If there was one thing that you could tell the media to think about when they, when they, uh, when they write about design, um, what would that be? In other words, you read the reviews of a car, maybe even not one of your own. What do you think that the media often misses? Jay? Um, I think a lot of the times it's how essential American culture is in designing cars. And it's, that's regardless of what brand it is. Um, there's this really deep-rooted uh, heritage and cultural value and you know again the whimsicalness of uh, auto automotive culture a lot of the times that's not presented well or as much as it should be. Derek? 
What's, what does the media miss when, when writing the review of a new car's styling? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a, it's, you know, there's a few things, but probably the biggest thing is just kind of the importance of interior design. You know, I get a sense that more and more... Aren't, the, the, aren't those the color and trim girls? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you know, but that's a huge part. To that's me, the average person buys a car a lot about, you know, a lot of it is how they feel when they get in the car and the technologies, and I feel like... We're in a, if any area is rapidly changing, it's interior, it's interior technologies, it's materials and finishes, and I feel like the companies that are doing that the best are the companies that are also are leading the industry, you know? Peter, what, what, what would you uh, tell someone in the media if they were uh, wanting to know how to review a car's design? I think I, 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 I you know, I, I was, um, this is quite a difficult question. I was happy that you asked the other gentleman before yeah, me. Still. And I, I very much agree with what, what Derek is saying, that I think that uh, the interior is not getting enough attention yet. And uh, I think that uh, to ha have a, 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 like a nice, high-quality interior with, a, with a, a, a good touch and feel and a nice smell and all these things, is very very important. You know, you spend a lot of time in a car, and I'm I'm often surprised that when we when we uh, uh, well, I, I'm disappointed actually that when we do a new new car new and a new interior, then uh, the different markets are asked, uh, uh, you know, what what kind of level of quality do you like? Because it always, you know, depends on the price also. And then always they go on and say, yeah, in Europe they, you know, they expect a lot and everything and leather here and there and, and this and that. In America, they don't care. So I'm talking a bit in black and white now. And, and uh, I think this is something, it is my feeling that the America, American customers also more and more will, will um, be more aware of this kind of thing and they, you know, uh, um, and expect a, a, a better level of, of uh, interior, perceived quality, materials, uh, um, touch and feel and smell and sounds and everything. Um, to, is, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of projects as an interior designer myself. And uh, I, I think that's that, the... Uh, striped socks. Exactly. <laughs> And I think that a, a, a car is really only a good car if X and interior go together. You know, if they together, that makes the car. If you have a great exterior sit inside and you're disappointed, you just, you know, it's, it's, it's only half the thing. She couldn't cook. Richard? Well, maybe media could, might want to cover um, the backstory. What I do you mean, mean by the backstory? The backstory, when I mean, there's so much love and passion that goes behind even a $10,000 car. You know, the same love and passion that goes into a $10,000 car as there is a $200,000 car. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, designers are a very unique breed. You know, learn about them. They're, they're highly emotional and <laughs> a bit strange. Complicated. And complicated <laughs> and very reality TV show worthy. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of love, and, and I think if people knew that, I think if customers knew what designers go through, how much they actually care about every last millimeter that customers may not even see, um, I think cars will sell better. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, love, certainly, for the four of you for making time for tonight's event. I know some of you have very strict schedules hereafter. I think a few of you may still be available to spend some time in Q&A with some of our members. But at this point, I think we should take the opportunity to thank you for very sincerely for coming and for speaking forthrightly with us. And again, to John Grafman for lining this all up. Thank you. Thanks to, again, everybody. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do something a little bit different this year. Instead of a group Q&A, we're just going to break and mingle. And those of you who can stay, it would be great.
Tune in for another episode of Right Track Motoring.